All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I'm Min from Heltech, and I'm so happy to see you all here again. Today, on the 3rd of August, we are going to organize Heltech Cloud Computing with three special keynotes. And for those who are new to us, to Heltech, we are the largest tech meetup in Helsinki, featuring various tech topics um, on the first Monday of each month. And Heltech brings together uh, tech talents, startup enthusiasts, experts from different industry, academia and investors to discuss the fresh trends in the relaxed setting. And thank you, a thank you note to our uh, partners, Auto DG Platform and CGI for making this event happen. And uh, what has happened? Due to the current situation, we have to organize everything virtually. But let's hope that uh, this event and the second, the two more upcoming will be the last uh, virtual events. And uh, on November, we will be organized physical event, hopefully, in Claren Hotel. And yes, and don't forget to ask your questions for the speakers online. We will be um, gathering questions to ask in a Q&A session. And about the social media, don't forget to uh, follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook to receive more news and more interesting events coming up. All right, and without further ado, let's introduce our first speaker of today, Professor Tariq Taleb from University of Auto and University of Oulu. Tariq, uh, the stage is yours. Okay, um, th thank you for the um, Thank you for the introduction. Um, first of all, I would like to double check if you can see my slides. You can have yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, once again, thank you for this opportunity where I would like to share with you some of my uh, views on, um, um, on this um, crossroads of two domains that have been actually working separately, cloud computing and networks. Um, as I have been introduced earlier, I'm actually um, working for both the University of uh, Oulu and Aalto University. Um, before I delve into the details of this uh, talk, I would like to briefly introduce Mosaic Lab, which I have founded basically six years ago, Mobile Networks Authorization and Service Customization, it stands for. Um, it's a lab actually um, which is part of the Department of Communications and Networking, which is part of the School of Electrical Engineering in Alto University. Um, we do lots of research on um, the concept of network authorization that I'll be introducing today. But uh, to sum them up, actually they are in these uh, four directions. Uh, we work on um, how to um, customize and program mobile networks. Um, and this is in the context of network authorization, as I mentioned earlier. When we talk about network authorization, it's not only the authorization of networks, but also uh, service delivery platforms like uh, the ones that we use when we watch Netflix or YouTube, such as content delivery networks. That's actually the second research direction. Um, we also look into the problem of connectivity um, within 5G and beyond for um, uh, devices such as UAVs and manned aerial vehicles. And we see how these UAVs with connectivity of 5G and beyond can actually help in this sphere of Internet of Things. Uh, security is very important, and that's why we look into how we can leverage 5G enabling technologies like the ones that we'll be talking to, um, to you about, software-defined networking, network function virtualization, cloud computing, how we can uh, use these technologies to provide security on demand and quickly uh, to support any service which is provided on um, in a virtualized manner on cloud computing. Um, the team is quite um, young, but uh, consisting of actually very um, enthusiastic and very um, uh, brilliant students as well as staff. Uh, we have actually strong hands-on experience with lots of um, tools. Um, of course, um, some of them relevant to cloud computing like OpenStack, Kubernetes. Um, LXC, Docker. Um, we also contribute to these kind of open sources like Onos. Um, and um, 
as I said, we're we're quite young, but we are also very very brilliant, and we don't fear, you know, to try these new uh, tools and even contribute to them. Um, all right, so that was really in brief about uh, Mosaic Lab. But if you're interested, you're more than welcome to visit um, our website. Uh, now let's talk about this um, crossroads for cloud and networks. As I mentioned earlier, uh, these two domains till 2014, 2015, um, you know, experts from cloud computing and experts from network uh, domain, they were not even talking to each other. Um, everybody was working, you know, in his own domain or her own domain, and um, there was no synergies between the two. And in my humble opinion, um, uh, 5G um, initiative has actually uh, brought these two, the expertise from these two domains together. And that's why we have actually, um, uh, as I will um, introduce to you, um, we've been seeing that cloud is actually a very important enabler of the 5G um, um, requirements, as well as the 5G features, which I will be introducing in the next um, uh, slides. So basically, um, always in any next generation mobile network, we're looking for better, um, higher capacity, better reliability, better efficiency, uh, better spectrum um, uh, um, efficiency, um, and also latency. And as you know, uh, one millisecond end-to-end -end latency has been a very critical uh, requirement of uh, 5G. A uh, very important requirement on uh, 5G, uh, this slide is I'm actually borrowing from Ericsson, but um, 5G is supposed to be a platform on which um, any kind of application should be, um, um, should be executable. So basically, the platform should be designed not only for nowadays services, but it should be also able to accommodate the services that will come, say, in five years from now or even 10 years. In, in one word, the platform has to be very agile. Um, uh, when we talk about uh, users of 5G, we're not restricting ourselves to individual users like ourselves that we use phones, but we talk also about verticals, uh, and verticals uh, basically they come with many end users that are actually enjoying the service which is provided by, by that vertical. Um, and these can be um, in different segments in, um, or, or sectors in automotive, in healthcare, in uh, UAV, and so on and so forth. Um, and the requirement here is actually when you want to launch or you want to support a vertical, um, the, the, the platform or the network that will actually support that vertical should be delivered as quicker as possible. So here we're talking about rapidity, flexibility, and also elasticity, um, you know, to support this kind of vertical markets. Um, reducing the cost, in my humble opinion, has been a very, very important factor, you know, in the design of the 5G and also in um, the usage of cloud um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the network um, or the concept of network authorization as I will be introducing. Um, so there is always this uh, dilemma that, you know, you um, create um, a powerful uh, network system, you give more bandwidth to people and then people start to use it and then uh, you're dealing with lots of data that you have to deliver. But at the same time, uh, don't expect people to be paying, um, you know, what they used to pay before. So there is always this average uh, revenue per user is, 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 is getting down. So this actually um, has been even forecast maybe uh, e even 12 years back, you know, by Cisco. Uh, you can see that the traffic increases, the average revenue per user is stagnant or even declining in some cases. So you have to deal with lots of traffic, but at the same time, you have to keep, you know, the investment in your infrastructure as, as um, cost efficient as possible. So when we add these features to the, uh, to the known um, network requirements, then we're talking about cost efficiency, agility, elasticity, flexibility, rapidity, and people that are actually in the cloud domain, they would understand that these features are actually somehow the attributes of cloud computing system. This actually cloud is supposed to help you flexibly deploy your service, rapidly deploy it. Uh, yes, it gives you this feature of elasticity, uh, agility, and also uh, pay as you go. And that's actually the, the whole game behind cost efficiency. So this has actually pushed for this concept of network authorization. And um, what does that mean? Um, this is actually, um, I think, one of the definitions of this concept of network authorization from ITUT. Um, and it's an overall transformation. Um, um, it's a new trend for designing, implementing, deploying, managing, and maintaining you know, network equipments that we used to have 
running on dedicated, very expensive uh, equipment. Now we want to redesign them so they can be um, executable on virtualization platforms on cloud. Okay. Um, I hope that I'm still heard well. Yeah. All right. So um, basically, if I want to sum up, you know, the concept of network authorization, there are two main objectives. The first one is we want to change, to redesign the network functions, um, uh, make them softwareized, make them piece of software that can run on any virtual, on any cloud, on any kind of virtualization platform, and even we want to decompose them in smaller uh, modules, and that's actually the concept of microservice. Once we have that, then we should be able to run them, um, you know, on um, any kind of cloud, anywhere, on the right amount of resources, the right place, and even be able to manage, you know, the life cycle of that, um, what we call slice. Um, and we create that slice, you know, uh, in way which is customized to the service that is supposed to deliver. For example, um, uh, an end-to-end -end network slice, which is suitable for a social network uh, like um, a service like Facebook or for automotive or for Internet of Things and you name it. Um, yes, I mentioned the, the word slice and um, you may wonder what a slice mean. Um, all right, so there are actually different uh, definitions, but I'll show you um, soon, you know, what a slice mean, at least in the concept of, um, you know, these network slices. Uh, so basically what we have nowadays, we have data centers, um, huge ones, which are cent centralized, like those of Google, of Amazon, of uh, Facebook. Uh, and of course, these data centers, they are connected through a network. And we have some small scale data centers, which we call edge cloud. Some of them already deployed. Some of them, they will be deployed. So basically what we have nowadays as a, as an, as a physical infrastructure is um, a number of data centers deployed here and there, and they are connected via a network. So basically, if you go to Amazon, um, you know, EC2, you know, a controller, and you ask for um, a virtual machine with certain flavor, with certain uh, amount of CPU then you know, and storage, then in my opinion, what you're getting, you're getting like um, a slice of certain amount of computation, certain amount of storage. And that's what I would call computing only slice. Um, if you set up a VPN between a network node and another network node, or between your server and uh, another server somewhere else, um, basically you are actually getting certain amount of network resources. And of course you can create, you know, many VPNs and, you know, in that way you are actually getting a slice of uh, some network resources with specific bandwidth between a uh, router or between a point to another point. Um, and that's actually some a concept which is quite old. You know, that's what we know as not network overlay. If you go to Amazon and even you specify, you say, I want to have a container or I want to have a VM. And on that, I want to run, you know, certain operating system like Ubuntu or Windows. And I want to run on it like a certain function like uh, Nginx or uh, um, uh, DNS uh, or a load balancer. Then actually what you're asking for, you're asking for computation, you're asking for um, storage, and you're asking even specifying what kind of virtual network function that, be sh that should be running on each of these uh, virtual resources. And here we're talking about computation slash storage and VNF uh, slice. Actually, in the context of 5G, we're not looking only for those kind of slices, but we're looking for a full-fledged slice. Basically, I want to have the right amount of resources, uh, the right software being running on them, uh, virtual network functions, and even I want to maintain the connectivity between these different um, um, virtual network functions that could be running on the same data center or completely different uh, data centers, and I should be able even to maintain connectivity between them and even, um, you know, define it and change it and manage it, uh, you know, in softwareized way, and that's actually software-defined networking concept, um, even if things, you know, keep on shuffling and moving and changing and so on. So that's actually the full-fledged slice that we're looking for. Um, from the user, user perspective, from, from our side, you know, as users of these kind of terminals, uh, basically just to show you the, the, the way where, we, where we're going, uh, basically the user equipment doesn't have to be only a phone. Actually, your laptop, if it is connected to 
uh, you know, uh, the network via SIM card or like if you have a car which is connected, you know, um, to, um, to, um, to the mobile network, that's actually user equipment. But nowadays what we have, um, we have our phone, we subscribe to a certain mobile operator. Uh, if I want to use Facebook, then I am connecting via that mobile operator to Facebook. Uh, if I want to use uh, watch YouTube, then I'm connecting via the same mobile network to access, you know, YouTube uh, services and so on. So it's basically one network which is serving different services um, with different requirements. Um, yes, this has been working okay, but you know, uh, it's not you know it's not the right way. You know, when you think about verticals and you think about this. Uh, ultra low latency, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, communication services. So the idea is actually, basically, maybe this is not going to happen, but, you know, this is just to picture to you the idea, is uh, basically if I click on Facebook or any kind of social network service, which, you know, um, whose packet needs to be uh, treated in certain way, uh, when I click on Facebook icon, I would go to the Facebook network slice. So it's basically my packets of Facebook go via the the, the, the network slice, which are which is created in a very suitable way to the packets and to the service requirements of Facebook. If I do um, a streaming service, the same thing happens. If I want to access, you know, specific Internet of Things service, then I am actually, um, um, you know, having my packets or my service being delivered over a network slice which is suitably created for that specific service. And definitely there will be always a default network slice which is going to be used for, um, say, best effort uh, services, um, voice communication, and so on and so forth. So that's actually the idea. Like from the UE side, from the user equipment side, you know, the user equipment will be able to connect to multiple slices and, you know, consuming those services in the best um, uh, way. So to explain this even further and to showcase, you know, this crossroad which is happening between cloud and network, um, let, let me use the example of Gmail, for example. Um, Gmail, if I want to access my Gmail on my mobile phone when I'm connecting to the mobile network, basically my emails, they are actually stored in Google data center. You know, um, uh, all the processing is happening there. But as I said earlier, I still have to connect to a mobile network operator so I can access my Gmail um, 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 emails. So basically, cloud computing has been restricted to the service uh, that is used by the end user. Actually, we want to extend the concept of cloud computing beyond data centers. So basically, even the network, the connectivity network, the network which will enable me to connect to my Gmail, uh, just an example here, the network itself is running on the cloud. So it's basically, we're extending the concept of cloud computing towards mobile end users. So everything is actually offered as a cloud service, including the radio access network, including the mobile core network. And of course, you know, the service is being hosted at the data center. So in this way, we have mobile connectivity, decentralized computing. If we're talking about edge computing, smart storage, everything is offered as one atomic end-to-end -end service. And then it comes with all of these nice features of cloud computing, which is on-demand, elasticity, multi-tenancy, pay-as-you-go, and all of these actually help in achieving the features which I have actually introduced in the beginning of 5G. Um, just to recall, uh, to remind you, is cost efficiency, agility, you know, elast elasticity, and so on and so forth. So there are actually um, many enabling technologies. Um, I'm listing here the most important ones, software-defined networking, network function virtualization. And since we talk about cloud, cloud computing, yes, cloud computing has actually a very important and very crucial role in the whole, in the whole thing. Um, when, when we want to virtualize the network, basically we, this is a, a very typical architecture of the evolved packet system, of the LTE architecture, if you want. Of course, things have been changing in the context of 5G. But basically, when we talk about the virtualization of the network, we can virtualize the data plane only, uh, basically those equipments that are actually processing the packets. Not very uh, advisable for the moment. You can do the control plane only. And basically, that's really what, you know, control plane is all, all about, you know, handling signaling packets and so on. And cloud is supposed to be good at, you know, handling, um, um, you know, um, messages and so on. Uh, you can do also the radio access network. You can do any combination of this. So here you have the flexibility in, um, you know, virtualizing, 
you know, the whole network fully or just, you know, part of it as per the needs and the requirements of the service that you have in mind. So, um, you know, in my opinion, this, um, this, this, um, this network slicing, as I have introduced earlier, I, I see it as a very interesting journey, which is going to lead us to a very innovative world. And this is exactly really what I believe in. Um, to explain that, um, let's see what happened, you know, uh, in what I call the pre-Apple era, where maybe be, we're talking here about the uh, years of 2004 up to, yeah, up to 2004, 2005. Actually, we had, um, everything was kind of closed. So we had the user equipment locked. Basically, you have phones that were really ugly designed. Um, the radio access network is still closed. It's under the um, ownership of one single entity, um, which is uh, basically the mobile operator. Mobile core network, the same thing. The services, they were actually, the, the whole network telecom area was, you know, they, they were having this basic principle that the services will be under the control of mobile operators. So if you want to enjoy uh, a new service, in addition to the connectivity itself, you know, that allows you to do voice communication, then you have to pay for additional subscription. Uh, in my opinion, you know, the big success of, um, of Steve Jobs or uh, Apple was actually that they opened the user equipment in a sense that they offered um, interfaces, you know, to the mobile application developers. And that's why you start seeing a lot of interesting mobile applications being uh, developed and put, you know, on iTunes or Google Play Store and the like. And then it's up to the market, you know, to decide how popular these services should be. So in this way, you know, the services and the user equipment, these two segments, you know, got open. And in this way, we started seeing a lot of interesting um, uh, innovations. So, um, now, when we do this virtualization of the network and when we run things on the cloud and we can offer them as cloud service, basically what we're aiming for is, um, yes, we softwareize the network equipment, the network functions, and we make sure that they can run actually on the cloud, on any virtualization platform. And then we offer these APIs, those interfaces, to any entity a person or company that is interested in developing application. And we say, look, it's not only the service that should be running on the cloud, but even the network that will be actually supporting, you know, that service will be actually also cloud service. And in this way, you'll be having lots of slices that can treat, you know, different, you know, services in different manners, uh, in different ways. And now we open the user equipment, the services, and we see lots of innovation. So just imagine what could happen when you have the full, you know, chain, um, you know, uh, radio access network, the mobile core network being open. I think only one's um, imagination that can be limited to what you can do uh, uh, in terms of innovation and creativity. Um, and this is exactly, you know, the, the, the vision. It's like basically you'll be able to create network slices. Um, which are suitable for the service that you have in mind, be it a social network service, be it um, um, an automotive service, be it an Internet of Things service, and um, uh, so on and so forth. Um, cloud, of course, is um, not only, um, you know, is not only seen as an enabler for this virtualization of the network and provide, you know, making the network itself as cloud service, but, you know, it, it's going even um, one big step further by actually offloading the computation of the user equipments that we have nowadays, um, you know, offloading them to the cloud. And in this way, you know, we don't need to have those expensive user equipments, or even if we have, I mean, nowadays there are lots of interesting services that we cannot enjoy on our mobile phones because our mobile phones are actually limited in the, their processing capability. So uh, imagine that the processing, the computation, everything happens at the edge cloud, and then you are, you know, your, your mobile phone is just there, you know, to uh, display for you the service. So then lots of interesting things will happen. Uh, and that include virtual reality, augmented reality, mobile gaming, uh, and so on. And so on. Google Glasses, probably it will come back, you know, as, as, as a very interesting, you know, uh, device. And I think Apple is um, already working. And I think there were like some kind of uh, uh, rumors that, you know, the next user equipment is not mobile phones is not uh, laptops, but it's actually glasses. So, but the, the, the bottleneck there is the hardware. So if you have to offload the process in the computation to the cloud, then you know lots of things will be uh, possible. All right, so um, I think uh, you've seen already this slide. 
uh, requirements on 5G, the features, yes, actually cloud can help a lot, you know, um, in achieving, in meeting some of these um, um, features. Uh, the requirements definitely will not, I mean, we were having a very, very ambitious, you know, requirements on 5G. In my humble opinion, that will not happen, you know, in the time frame of 5G, which is going to be, which is already deployed in some countries or is going to be deployed, you know, uh, in the very coming, um, you know, months, um, not years, but months. Uh, but to be honest with you, the, the very, very true success story, you know, 5G, in my humble opinion, is that actually it was a technology and the only technology that could bring together expertise from two areas that were working separately, cloud computing and also telecom. And this is really, this is the, the main topic of, of today, this crossroad between cloud and network. And with basic principles of software engineering, you know, we could actually achieve or we could at least you know put proof of concept of this um, uh, this concept of uh, network authorization and the proof is that actually yes now you see lots of open sources where you have communities from these areas sitting all together under the same you know roof and trying to find solutions and you know uh, bring te technology that will actually fulfill you know the requirements of cloud computing providers and also of mobile operators towards this vision of network authorization of course, I'm not mentioning Kubernetes here, but there are lots of other solutions which are actually going in the same, in the same line. So, um, cloud is not going to stop here. Uh, definitely, cloud will be having much stronger presence in the beyond 5G. Uh, definitely, you know, the concept of network softwareization that I have mentioned, still we have lots of things to do there. But we still have to exploit much further and in a much more efficient way, you know, the concept of multi-service, multi-tenancy of cloud, uh, Softwareization of the network itself, there are lots of issues relevant to security, reliability that have to be dealt with. Uh, the network itself is needs to be redesigned. There are lots of things to be changed, you know, to make the network itself very cloud native. Um, yes, there has been some initial thoughts happening already in the standards, and here is the concept of service-based uh, architecture of 5G. Uh, these are just like some of the features, this, you know, um, um, uh, extensibility, uh, you know, microservice concept, being open to the third uh, third parties and so on. All of these actually they are, you know, uh, going to contribute to the cloud nativeness of the network. So the network can run actually on any cloud in, you know, um, in a very efficient way while still ensuring that 5.9 reliability, the 99.999% reliability which is needed for the networks. Um, I think with cloud, um, we will be seeing also new ways of routing. Um, uh, we're not talking only about routers, you know, the, the path of communication should go from a router to another one, but no, the cloud themselves, there will be also points in that, um, in that routing, uh, because you would need actually data centers to do for you certain computation, AI or whatever, so you can actually forward the packet to the next segment, to the next node, and so on and so forth. So cloud will be also, you know, part of the route itself, of the networking route. Um, AI um, definitely is something which is uh, gaining lots of momentum. Many people are actually interested in AI. Um, and this is also taken into the design of the network. So this is um, one function which is being standardized. It's called network data uh, analytics um, uh, function and actually with AI and with the with the processing capability that we're supposed to have from cloud then actually we will and with the smart connectivity which we're expecting actually from 5G and beyond uh, then you know many things many services will be really automated and that will impact many parts of our uh, many aspects of our lives uh, and these are actually just some screenshots which I have taken from a uh, promotion video of the 6G flagship, uh, which is um, uh, being uh, run, you know, at the University of Oulu, and I'm very honored to be part of it. So I really strongly advise and recommend to people uh, attending, you know, to have a look at that video, just to see, you know, what kind of use cases, you know, um, we're expecting in 6G and where cloud, AI, you know, connectivity, smart connectivity can play a big role. So in my humble opinion, uh, 5G was really the technology that brought cloud and network, you know, uh, experts, you know, to the same uh, location, working together towards, you know, the same um, uh, um, target uh, technologies. I think 6G is the thing which will be uh, bringing AI stakeholders into the game. And I think, um, you know, the, wo the world will, will be really uh, exciting and very interesting, you know, um, uh, um, for us. So personally, I'm very excited about it and uh, we're looking forward 
you know, the opportunities that this is going to bring, this new eco ecosystem will bring us. So with this, I come to the end. I thank you for your attention. And um, as the moderator mentioned, I'll be more than happy to receive questions and um, answer them. All right. Thank you, Tarek. That was an amazing speech. And uh, I have received some questions from the audience. So would you mind if I ask you some questions? Please, go ahead. Yes, awesome. So um, the question is, how infrastructure as a code will change within the 5G com cloud computing era? I'm sorry, say again your question? Yeah, of course. So uh, the question is, how infrastructure as a code will change in 5G complete, uh, computing era? How the infrastructure as what? As a it will code. change? Yeah, so how infrastructure as a code, like encoding, will change yeah. with a 5G cloud computing era? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I need to pass this question. I didn't fully understand it. Um, um, yeah, how the infrastructure um, will be changing. So I don't know. Um, no. Yeah, um, I will make sure that I'll send all the questions later. Uh, okay. to you so yeah. you can answer the audience question and um, okay so um, this is a question from mine because I, I was pretty uh, curious so how does uh, ac academia and research labs play a role in the transformation uh, in helping the companies in the transformation phase to a cloud enable enterprise so all right. Um, well, well, actually, uh, it's very interesting, actually, in, in, in um, at least in the research work that I do, it's quite industry oriented. Um, uh, personally, I um, before joining Alto University, I was working for industry for a Japanese company called NEC. Um, my humble opinion is actually in, in most of the cases in industry, uh, we work on um, projects which are actually quite short term. Um, you know, six year, six months, uh, maximum one, two years. So uh, things that could have impact on product. And in my opinion, that actually limits a bit, um, you know, the creativity that people could, um, you know, could bring, um, you know, um, um, to whatever research they do. In academia, at least, we don't have that um, uh, limitation. So basically, we can work on um, really futuristic things. And um, if the research work is done, uh, in the right way, taking into account standards, what's going on with industry, taking into uh, account the needs, you know, for industri industry, I think we can, uh, in, uh, act, uh, the research we do in academia, at least we can create proof of concept that can demonstrate to the companies that there is some potential in certain technology or in certain way of using the technology. So um, uh, that's how we see um, academia can help industry. Um, um, and um, don't forget that actually while, while doing research in academia, we also educate students and we prepare them to be, you know, the next leaders of industry and also the next contributors right. to those companies. Awesome. That's answer all of my concerns, all of my um, questions in my head. And there's one last thing. So um, Ayn has asked the question, so what cloud computing certifications are needed for a data engineer? All right. Uh, there are many, but I would um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, uh, but definitely there are there are, there are you know, in, in the area of cloud computing, I would strongly uh, recommend to uh, enthusiasts about this topic to get certificates of Kubernetes, of OpenStack, you know, this kind of open sources that can allow you to orchestrate, you know, uh, cloud computing. Uh, technologies of containers uh, like uh, Docker and so on. These are actually technology that should, that uh, people interested in this topic should uh, probably acquire skills in. But um, if you want to have one specific and very important, you know, certificate for the time being, I would say Kubernetes. All right. So uh, I think that's all of uh, my questions. Uh, thank you, Tarek, for your participation. And um, I wish you a nice day. So. Thank you so much, and also thank you again for having me um, on Helltech. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Awesome. So that was our first speaker. And as I mentioned before, uh, our audience, please don't be shy. Ask your, um, write down your questions in the magical comment box, and I will make sure that I'll ask them in the Q&A session with other speakers as well. If your questions were not asked, then I will also be collecting them later on and send them to the speakers and you will receive your answers soon. All right, so 
Uh, let's not waste any more time. Let's welcome our second speaker of the day, Yussi Makinen, the commercial lead and data estate at NorCloud. Uh, Yussi, the stage is yours. Hey guys, can you see me? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. So uh, lovely to be here um, to talk about uh, cloud computing. Definitely a, a topic that's uh, close to my heart. So um, I work at North Cloud. I've been here for uh, two and a half years now. Um, first time I run our uh, Finnish business, um, and now I transitioned into a new role. So I'm responsible of, of our uh, data business on, on European level something that's really upcoming and, and fast growth area for us. Um, today, I was thinking of, um, of sharing some of the, like the principles and, and the, the key thoughts around the cloud computing in general uh, for the audience. Of course, it's a relatively short slot for such a broad, uh, broad topic, but uh, I'm trying to cover the the areas that are, are like uh, most commonly discussed today and, and most relevant, at, at least for me and what I see every day in, in our working life. Um, happy to go deeper into these topics later or through the questions, um, but unfortunately I can't cover everything in, in this, um, this page. So here we go. Um, I'm trying to share my screen here. Hopefully you can see my screen now. Yeah. Excellent. So uh, first I uh, wanted to share briefly about North Cloud, so the company where I come from. Uh, we've been here since 2011, so founded in Finland. Um, currently we operate in, in 10 countries in Europe directly, but of course uh, support our global customers uh, globally. We've been one of the fastest growing companies in Europe for the past years, uh, recognized by companies such as Financial Times and Deloitte and, and many others. Um, additionally, uh, we are partnered up with uh, Amazon, uh, Microsoft and Google. And all of these players, we're on the strategic partnership level, uh, the highest tier uh, global level that the service provider can reach. Uh, and so we are doing public cloud only, which is something we call cloud native. We don't do hybrid. We don't do those like physical infrastructure elements or, or similar. We only do public cloud because we believe that moving forward, at least 90%, if not 100% will be in public cloud. Uh, and and the, the other scenarios such as hybrid is, is just like a stepping stone towards public cloud. Uh, we've been uh, recognized by many research houses. Many of, uh, of you probably recognize Gartner. So um, we've been in the Gartner Magic Quadrant uh, for a public cloud since it was published. Um, and, and today our position there is, is a challenger um, and we're um, number fourth uh, globally in terms of ability to execute. So. Uh, that pretty much means that we're pretty successful with, with the projects that we're doing with European customers. Um, and with regards to the customers, um, our primary markets are the Nordics and Germany. Uh, currently, we have approximately 50% of the NASDAQ OMX uh, 40, meaning the 40 biggest companies in the Nordic as Nordcard customers. And more specifically, um, in Finland, uh, out of the top 20 companies, 17 are North Cloud customers. And in an, our other primary market, Germany, uh, we work uh, primarily with the automotive industry uh, and the retailers and investment and banking players in the market. Um, then when we, when we talk about public cloud, I think it's first uh, relevant to, to talk about the customer standpoint and where are the customer organizations uh, currently. So the organizations that are taking uh, these public cloud elements into use. Um, so pretty much um, all of the, the media and many discussions, it's about uh, the digital transformation, it's about the, the data-driven business, 
um, and, and then for organizations, it's about how to actually get there one day. And for any company, this means high degree of change, like a constantly changing environment for the business and IT. Um, and as, as like a Gartner has already said years ago that every company is now a software company. And when you really think about the digital services, the digitalization in general, it's actually all about applications. So how you deliver value in any context in digital, if you really think about it, it boils down to applications and eventually coding. So one might argue that the organizations who are really well prepared and enabled uh, in producing code will be successful moving forward. Um, in, in the same context of, of the, the, like the future uh, visions and um, building the digital business, one has to also recognize the fact that all of the organizations are currently, or not all, but most of the organizations um, are struggling financially within the IT. So many organizations are facing cost optimization initiatives, uh, both in IT and, and business processes. So from the business side, this means like optimizing the way the business has been done for years. So optimizing the processes, optimizing the operations. Uh, and then for the IT, it means that you need to run the IT in more cost effective manner. And in some cases, also, some of the organization have started building successfully new digital business capabilities, which then have eventually transformed the entire organization in a way that the previously existing IT assets and the capabilities built there have actually become obsolete due to the new digital capabilities. And then for the organization of, of, of uh, the company, it, it's, a, it's a bit difficult because the, the roles of, of the business and IT have become a bit shady in, in many cases. So what is the role of IT? Is it about enabling the business? Is it about running uh, the IT or is it about innovating? Uh, and, and then vice versa for the business. Uh, so these are like the major things that our customers or any companies is actually currently thinking about. Um, but then why public cloud for enabling this transformation? So what's so different and, and what's so interesting about public cloud in general? Uh, I, I believe that the first thing um, one should look for is, is the investment in, into technology and into R&D. Um, this is an illustration where I picked up some of the, <clears throat> some of the R&D spending figures from 2019 for uh, relevant IT players um, or technology providers. And everybody knows that with money, you can get innovation because you can get people, the right people, the skilled people, you can enable the culture that is required for innovation. You can fund more experiments and so on and so forth. So basically the investment in R&D is correlating to the capabilities that you're able to provide to the customers to improve their business. Um, and it's interesting to see from this picture that the hyperscalers, meaning the uh, public cloud service providers, are investing quite a lot compared to the traditional mega vendors such as IBM, Oracle, and SAP. And furthermore, if you start to explore the, the financials of, of these companies and what is the growth rate uh, for these companies and what is the profitability, then you realize that, okay, many of actually these hyperscalers will have even moving forward, more ability to invest in R&D. And why is this important? 
uh, it's important when you start making decisions on where do you actually want to build your company's competitive assets into. Do you want the technology to be future-proof or do you want your technology to be obsolete uh, in one or two years' time? Um, and just a brief illustration on the pace of innovation today and also yesterday when you look at the picture uh, within the public cloud. So this picture is taken from one of the AWS events uh, some time back. Um, and the pace of inno innovation is, is extremely rapid in this space. So if you imagine that 2008, there were 24 new capabilities launched daily, whereas 2017, it's already 1,400 plus new capabilities daily. And with the growth and development and profitability of, in this case, AWS, the pace is only accelerating. So now we're talking about 2,000 and plus services and it's constantly increasing. And what this means is that the customer for this uh, technology provider is, of course, enable, enabled uh, to use the most modern technology in the most cost-efficient manner to build the business on. Um, and then we get into what are the typical benefits and how does the public cloud today enable the change for, for the organization? Um, and when we, especially in Finland, when, when I look into the different discussion and forums, it's a lot about, the discussions are a lot about you know, modernized infrastructure. So basically moving your data center uh, into public cloud and by doing that, um, reducing your cost level of IT, uh, improving the resilience, uh, the security, basically building the agility for the organization and perhaps after that, um, companies start to think about um, modernizing the applications on top of cloud, uh, from which you quite rapidly end up in the data discussion because the applications are empowered by the, the data. And, and so the data innovation is another thing where if you, if you think about it five years back, uh, if you wanted to use AI assets, so if you wanted to build AI-based solutions, you had to invest like $1 million beforehand to even start exploring something. Whereas today, anyone can go into any of these uh, technology providers um, and acquire those services and, and pay perhaps cents or dollars to use them in the, in the in the early phases of the of the innovation work. Additionally, of course, a huge chunk of the R&D investment money is, uh, of the hyperscalers is guided towards the data services. And of course, they are constantly launching new services like this year, uh, Azure launched the Synapse, and, and then, then there's the, the different Google BigQuery uh, assets and many other things that that are highly differentiated, something that's very difficult to compete against by, by a traditional means. And of course, the paper use models and, and, and the fast time to market and, and all of that makes makes the data assets actually something that's, uh, that's really hard to compete in any other means. But the, I guess the primary area which is not so much discussed today is the increased developer productivity. So if you think about the digital world and if you say that the future, the digital world is, is actually um, building applications for, for which you need to develop a lot of code, it would be highly beneficial for your organization to be efficient in coding and therefore developer productivity becomes critical for your organization. So we have had examples of customers where customer has done the traditional way uh, of developing services and, and then 
uh, we have supported the customer to start doing the cloud native uh, ways of developing applications, meaning like uh, functions based, you know, serverless, uh, highly automated uh, processes, and so on and so forth. Uh, and and the customer has actually reached fifty times the productivity they used to have. So with the same money, you get 50 times more. And this, of course, comes from the fact that you don't actually have to do manual work so much anymore. You don't have to do coding so much anymore because you use the functions um, and reusable other assets. And when the maturity of the practice at the customer uh, develops, it gets even better constantly. So this is actually one of the key drivers of the public cloud that is not really talked about as much as it should be today. How do the organizations then apply the capabilities and what is the, the cloud journey really for, for any, let's say, traditional enterprise? Um, of course, it, it typically is driven by the CEOs and, and boards, and, and this is a good um, Gartner image on what is really, really happening and what is expected. So there's two aspects of it. There's the optimization part. So where you want to optimize the existing business. And then there's the transformation part, which is about pursuing new business models, enhancing the existing business model, and even building some uh, completely new businesses. And when you start to think about this, actually, the optimized part, um, the data center shift into cloud is part of that optimization. And from there, when you move into the application modernization, you're actually starting to optimize your internal products and your processes because of the application transformation. And then Data is actually enabling all of this. So in all of these assets, all of these capabilities, you would want to use the most modern uh, data assets that enable your organization to benefit fully from the data assets that you have as a company. And whatever you do here, apart from some of the infrastructure elements, it's about writing code. So the more efficient you're in that, the well, or let's say the better your organization will do. Um, so what is required to be successful uh, within this space, within the public cloud space? Um, I could have written here like our, our um, best practice for, for uh, developing the, the, the cloud uh, journeys, but instead I just wanted to articulate some, some of the key areas that, that I see and, and what we see in the market. So first of all, it's, um, it's heavily driven by the experts. The experts in the market, it's, it's critical. So like cloud architects, at least for us as a company, are the, the most critical asset. Um, and there aren't too many cloud architects in the market, in any market. Um, uh, especially the kinds of professionals who have working experience, who have already delivered some projects. Uh, and this is why us um, as North Cloud, we have, we have been running these cloud universities where we basically take like traditional IT professionals who would be motivated to uh, start working in cloud. And we first educate them. Uh, into the, the basics of the public cloud. And, and then we take those guys in or girls into our projects and so they can work alongside with, with the seniors. And we have had pretty decent uh, experiences of that. And actually many of these guys are today uh, already seniors and, and they're educating uh, new juniors. So, so that is a, very critical asset. And we have had like heard stories from customers that one senior cloud architect is more valuable than 200 juniors. But it, it really depends on the, on the situation. But 
it is really critical to know what you're doing in this space because it's entirely different compared to the traditional IT uh, ways. Of course, you need the strategy and governance because this is a huge um, organizational change and organizational shift. You need to be able to manage the change somehow. Um, especially the governance is something that many organizations um, start with, um, simply because without that, you will be making a, a cool and expensive mess. So you need to have like a common ground, common understanding on how to operate and common rules for the organization, both business and IT. And then as in the previous, um, uh, previous uh, speech, there was uh, mentions about automation. So um, for us, the, the, the automation is, is really a, a key into this space. So if you think about how to be successful in cloud implementation in general, you need to have high degree of, of automation. And like our CTO, Ilya, puts it, it's that everything and everything can and will be automated. A good reference of that, for instance, is our managed service where we have only like few guys running a service that would typically in the traditional world take hundreds of people to run. And, but because of the automated capability, uh, it is highly efficient. Then we need to look into the, if we think about the change journey, we need to look into the, uh, into the culture and the way the organization functions. So if you try to embed cloud on top of like traditional IT model, that doesn't work, you end up making a mess. So as an entire organization, you need to transform towards or into modern agile world. And for each and every individual, this then means that you need to be uh, able to change. So uh, it means that the practitioners uh, within this space, like the most senior specialists in cloud, they educate themselves daily uh, and do that a lot. Uh, but it's also for the organizations, it's also for the, the IT structures, it's also for the ways of running certain businesses and business processes, etc. So many things will need to change. And this is probably one of the things why, or the reasons why people call cloud as the catalyst of, of uh, organizational transformation. And then one good example of the change is also the way uh, these cloud services should be procured in organizations. So the, the typical model, especially in, in the public sector and traditional organizations, it's, it's about uh, setting up an RFP with like predictable outcomes. Um, and, and then uh, it's really difficult for public cloud native organization who understands the more modern agile and the way the cloud engagements really go because they're iterative, uh, their mistakes are being made and, and the course is being changed constantly. So um, it doesn't really apply into the traditional IT sourcing model. And this is why many organizations should go towards the agile sourcing. This is, by the way, one of the reasons why we don't participate in many public sector tenders, because we don't see that they will be successful. Um, then, um, this is, by the way, my, my last slide, so I'm running out of time, but what everyone should consider today with regards to public cloud is that I think the center here, the red one, is interesting. That why would anyone buy packaged software anymore or SaaS? Because if if you are able to build yourself this world-class cloud-native development capability, 
you will outpace all of that. So basically building custom software has become so cheap that it makes sense for you to build an agile platform for yourself that also in the future enables you to change constantly with low cost and most modern technology enablers. Then the other question is the data estate. So does it make sense for you to invest in technology that will out be outpaced by the hyperscalers in one year or six months even? Uh, and then the question of the massive IT transformation program. So like the Gartner is saying that, was it 70% of the IT transformations fail? because everybody is trying to do this big bang. But does that really apply for tomorrow? Because in this world, you work iteratively, you work by, you know, like a business driver, you learn, you scale uh, into other areas. Um, and, and then you basically evolve as organization into the future. That, that is your vision compared to the, the thought of actually committing yourself into certain software uh, and then trying to mold that into something that would probably suit for you. Um, and then the future of organization and culture and trades, that is also something to think about. So is the future about if the future is about change, it is, if the future is about constant change, what kind of persons should you be hiring for your organizations? And what kind of culture should you be building? And that's, that was like my brief 20 minute session. Thank you guys. Hopefully there was some nuggets for you guys. All right. Uh, thank you, Yussi, for um, the informative speech. And uh, we have some uh, questions from the audience, if you uh, don't mind I'm asking. Of course. Yes. So the first question is, uh, what will be next after serverless? And we will have like a no code coding future um, for the companies? Yeah. That, that, that's a good question. Um, there's a, um, uh, what will be next? So, uh, it, it depends how you determine next, but, but there's, there's definitely like the, in the previous, in the end of the previous speech, there were some questions regarding the, I believe it was the edge question and the, the infrastructure as a code piece. Yeah. I think, um, I think the edge thing will, will now start um, to pick up pace and probably there will be some, some new ways of, of developing services. We're actually, that's actually one of the areas we are co uh, currently exploring in, in more detail. And I suppose that there will be new services launched towards the end of this year from our partners um, to, to boost that capability. So perhaps the edge-related um, uh, edge related um, capabilities, but what if what's next after serverless and the no coding? Um, that yeah, I don't I don't know. Is is my honest answer? Maybe it it is the some no coding. Um, services that are have been already launched this year from for instance Amazon um, and probably there will be more uh, similar services so that the, let's say the business uh, persons themselves can develop the services without um, a huge army of developers all right so uh I guess there's like constant changes in the industry so we never know what are waiting yeah. for us in the future yeah but I hope um, uh, the audience find uh, your questions are really great. And uh, there's a second one. So Mr. An, ask how is NotCloud 
support startup companies? How does your service uh, support and encourage um, startup traditional companies in transforming into cloud-enabled enterprises? So was that a question? How do we support yeah, how, startup companies yeah. or uh, how yeah, do so we in, how, uh, support? How does NotCloud support a startup companies? Startup companies? Yeah. All right. So we have a, a spe especially companies who are data intensive. Uh, we actually qu have quite many gaming companies. We have many uh, financial, uh, like um, financial services companies. We have uh, robotics companies. We have health tech companies. We have quite many of those kinds of um, data intensive companies where we we support them, of course, with the, well, sometimes if they're like a really startup, we help them from the scratch. So basically we build their entire product in some cases. So we, we do the infrastructure, we do the architecture, uh, we do the design, we do the development, we run the services, uh, we build and enhance the, the data capability for those organizations. And then sometimes we even help them build the ecosystem around them. All right, so that's a lot of work. That's a lot of support yep. that NorCloud can, can offer the companies. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think that's um, the last question. If there are uh, coming more, uh, I will let you know that there's, I will be gathering and collecting questions from the audience later on, and I will be sending, sending it to you. Right. But uh, otherwise, uh, thank you, Yusuf, for your participation. And uh, we are happy, I'm, I'm really happy to have you on stage today. Thank you. Cheers. All right. Yes, see you. Okay, so uh, that's the conclusion of the second speaker. And for the last one, last but not least, uh, we are so happy, so glad to have her on stage, Marcia Vilapa from uh, Amazon Web Service. She's the senior developer advocate, and she will be talking about serverless in cloud computing with Amazon Web Service. Marcia, the stage is yours. Hey, hello. I hope you can see me and hear me properly. Uh, yes. I'm super happy to be here. Uh, I will share my screen. Um, let's see. Mm, let's see how you do this. Okay. Awesome. It's sharing. Uh, let me know. Can you see my slides? Yes. Great. Because I cannot see myself so, <laughs> anymore. So uh, I will be talking a little bit about serverless with AWS. AWS stands for Amazon Web Services, but it's a shorter way. Uh, I don't think I need to introduce what Amazon is. Uh, I think has been talked a lot already. Um, but first, I want to introduce myself a little bit. I'm a developer advocate. I'm based in the Nordics, so I work a lot uh, with Nordic customers and, and developers in the Nordics, like you guys and girls. I've been doing serverless since um, early on, like it was announced in the end of 2014, and I started in the beginning of 2016 working with production loads in serverless and i have a youtube channel called fubar uh, where i post two or three videos every week about serverless hands-on tutorials and all kind of things serverless related so if you want to learn and get your hands into that you can go and check it out somebody was asking about certifications i do some kind of training as well for certifications in my youtube channel so you you can go and check it out there's quite a lot of material and if you have some questions and you don't get the time to ask them today to me i have my messages in twitter open so feel free to ask there so I want to start a little bit with the evolution of cloud computing and computing in general so I can set the scene for serverless. So the first thing is the physical machines. Maybe everybody in the audience is very young, but I'm not. And I remember my first project, uh, well, it was not my first project, but it was the first project I have really a contact with a physical machine when I was working directly um, onto it. Is somebody not mute in the call? I'm really hearing a lot of noises. Um, 
So uh, my first project was with physical machines and I had to work on application. We use um, really agile technologies and we took six months to develop the application and it took 10 months to get the physical machine onto the stage. So basically when you work with, the, with physical machines, you need to guess and do a lot of investment and it's very slow. It has a lot of things that luckily the cloud has solved and everything was possible because of virtualization. So basically when virtualization became mature enough, uh, the cloud was born and everybody was able to rent computing from someone else. So virtualization, we have been using it in many different ways. Uh, it allows you to have more elasticity on resources. You don't need to plan ahead. And if you're using the cloud, you don't need to uh, pay in advance or even know uh, how much you will need in the future future. You just need to know more or less how much you need right now. And then after virtualization, we have container containerization. It's a really hard work. And basically this helped a lot in the, again, in the elasticity and in the way that we can manage our applications. And also it helped to make everything faster and easier to deploy because now we can test in our local machines without needing to fake these virtual machines that were hard and, 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 and exhausting to replicate. Containers allow us to, to do a lot of development very, very fast. And these also enable people to, to develop applications applications way faster. But still, all of these are a progression of the same thing. It's basically the same paradigm like just it move uh, the ease of the developers. Serverless is a totally different paradigm. It's, it's a new thing. It's a new way of thinking and, and building applications. So if you have been building applications for containers, for sure you can build applications for virtual machines, and for sure you can do it in physical machines and the other way around. It, it doesn't change much how you build your applications. But when you go the serverless way, you need to rethink the ways that you are doing your applications. The first reason is that it's an event-driven applications in general when you're building serverless applications. It has, uh, I will talk about the details in, in a second, but it has very interesting characteristics that other technologies don't have in that way. So for something to be serverless, it has to adhere to these four kind of promises or tenants. The first one is scales automatically, meaning that before you need to plan somehow how much you need. Now with serverless, you just write your code or think your application, design your application, and the platform will take care of scaling it up and down according to your needs. You don't need to worry about that. Then you pay for what you use. This is something that comes from the cloud. It's a property of the cloud that you don't need to pay upfront. You just pay as much as you use. It's like utilities. You just uh, use electricity and you have a bill at the end of the month. You use AWS and you have a bill at the end of the month. No managing infrastructure. Again, this is another thing from the cloud that you don't need to manage a physical infrastructure. But still, if you are going with virtual machines in the cloud or containers, you still need to know the underlying infrastructure infrastructure that you are building your applications on top. You might need to know your, um, your servers, what is the capability, how much this, how much memory, and blah, 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 blah. When you're working with serverless, that's not something you need to care about. The infrastructure is um, something totally transparent for you. And lately, it's the high availability built in. Again, this is a property of cloud, but it takes one step further. That is the ability to, uh, all the serverless components are quite resilient inside a region. A region in AWS terms means, uh, for example, we have a Stockholm region that our data centers are in Stockholm and there is, if one data center fail, your application will not be impacted. If two data centers fail, your application will not be impacted. So there is need to be a huge catastrophe in order for your application to be impacted. So the high availability is, is very built in the serverless components. So if you look at all these, basically serverless is cloud 2.0, is an easier way to develop applications without needing to worry about a lot of underlying um, technological things. So when we talk about serverless, it comes in two flavors. The first one is functions as a service, and the second one is managed services or backend as a service. I need to find an image with two ice cream flavors, but well, what I can do. So the first one is the functions as a service, and it's what it gives the name to serverless. Before this was born in 2014, November 2014, nobody was talking about serverless. But then 
Lambda was born and people start talking about this. And what is Lambda? Well, for doing that, explaining Lambda, I will use the definition of Lambda from the website. And uh, Lambda and other functions as a service, other cloud providers have similar services, so this applies to all of them. So basically, this uh, function service allows you to run code without provisioning or managing services. So you just write your code, you upload it to the Lambda platform, and Lambda will take care of running your code when it's needed and scaling your code to make it high available. If you see, these are the premises of serverless that I just explained a second before. The difference with traditional applications and functions as a service is that this is event-driven. So basically, your code will be sleeping, your application will be sleeping, it will be totally idle until somebody or something triggers it. In a traditional application, your application is running and is listening to what is going on. So in here, basically, you pay for the amount of time your application is executing and not for the time that is idle. So how your application can be triggered? Well, it can be triggered for multiple different things. And this is the power of serverless. When you combine all these different services together with the function as a service, and you get this amazing, powerful application. So basically changes in the state. So serverless databases will emit events when a register change or was deleted or was added. Uh, storage will tell when there is a uh, file added or deleted or updated. Queues will send events when there is a new message in the queue. So many different um, Data services will be emitting events when something happens. Also, different requests like HTTP requests will uh, be able to trigger Lambda functions and changes in different resource states like somebody click a button or press a link can also trigger the Lambda. There is so many different triggers inside AWS and externally that I'm pretty sure you can find something that suits your needs. Then the function will run and the function can be written in any language. There is many supported by the function uh, platform itself, but then if you want to run your functions in something very specific that is not supported, we have the capability of build, bringing your own runtime. So it's pretty straightforward how you can implement that. And then if you want, you can run your functions in COBOL. I have seen that, so it's not a shock. Then what the function can do, it can do anything that code can do. It can call other HTTP events, like you need to do a request in another HTTP server. It can call AWS events, put messages in queue, store things in databases, store files. It can do machine learning. It can run business logic. Whatever you imagine, it can do. So then we have the managed services, and these are the most powerful part of serverless, in my opinion. There are all these services that are doing specific functionalities, like um, storing files, like S3 if you're using uh, used to AWS, managed queues, databases. It can be I don't know authentication services, analytics. There is many, 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 many managed services inside AWS and in other cloud providers that you can use. And these are services that are adhering those four uh, promises that I said in the beginning. If you think S3 is a perfect example on that, um, it scales automatically. Nobody thought that S3 doesn't have enough storage or it doesn't have capability to take care of the request. Uh, you can you pay as much as you use. You have one megabyte, you pay for one megabyte. You have 10,000 petabytes, you pay for that. You don't have to manage infrastructure. Nobody knows like or cares how S3 is implemented and where it's implemented. And it's high available, it's a regional service. So it has quite a lot of uh, resiliency and durability building. So this is managed services. And then you put them together like Lego pieces with the functions. You write your business logic. You create all this glue between all these managed services. And you end up with something like this. Don't get scared. This is a typical architectural diagram for a serverless application. It might look scary, but usually those functions are tend to be quite small and tend to do one thing. So you might have a very big diagram because it's just very exposed. But the idea is that you will have different components that will do something that will not be written by you. They will be provided by the platform or third parties. And then you use some uh, function code in the middle to glue the thing together or to write some business logic that is intrinsically specific for your application and then you pass it to the next service. So why to use serverless? 
Well, serverless, as I said, is a change of mindset, a change of paradigm on building applications. The key is to maximize the value provided by your developers and by the application building and minimizing the undifferentiated heavy lifting. There is so much work in development teams that is just useless and it's just needed there just to keep the lights on and to keep the infrastructure going and don't provide a really a benefit to the end users. Your end users doesn't care if you're running Kubernetes and having problems configuring that, or if you are running it on an Excel sheet. They care that their application is reliable, is secure, and is available. And that's what you have to provide your, your customers. How you run it is your problem. And the messes that you get into running very complicated infrastructure is something that you want to minimize as much as you can. So these are uh, Jeremy Daly and Jared Short are two serverless influencers. You can follow them if you want to know more about serverless. They talk about serverless a lot. And um, Jared also said that uh, a kind of nice way of thinking when to use serverless and when to use something that somebody else has built it. If the platform has it, use it. So for example, if you're building in AWS and you need to use queues, use a managed service for queues. Don't build your own. If you need database, use a managed service for database. You don't install your own database and manage it yourself. Something that if the market has it, buy it. Like you want to use uh, authentication and you want to use, uh, don't build it. I built four authentication services in my life for different companies and they are more or less exactly the same with some minimal things that nowadays you can use with OSIRO zero or Cognito. So just buy it, don't stress too much about it. It's not core to your application and you will spend a lot of time building it and maintaining it. And sometimes you can reconsider your requirements to try to go to step one and two because sometimes we have very specific requirements. Just think about if those requirements are really the core of your business or they're just not things that are nice to have. And if they are not the core of your business and they are not providing value, maybe just reconsider them. And if you need to build it, own it. So benefits. Just focusing on what is important for your business. This will make the speed to market crazily fast. After you have a team that is efficient and serverless, nobody can win delivering stuff. It's so fast because you are just building the necessary things to make your customers happy. And everything is so modular and the couple that if something doesn't work, then you can replace it very fast. So this is the main benefit of serverless, the speed to market, build your competitors, be the first ones to be there. And, 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 and that's for me, the amazing thing of serverless that you can focus on the real problem and not in the other things that are around um, computer science that becomes quite uh, hard on developers and, 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 and not ops people. So for serverless, you can do anything. You can build web applications, backend, data processing in real time. You can do chatbots, you can do Alexa, IT automations, machine learning, whatever you imagine can be done in serverless. And there are some use cases that might not be uh, still there, but if you look at the timeline of the new releases in AWS Lambda, AWS is listening to the customers all the time to try to remove those as, um, op obstacles in the way for people to use uh, Lambda to solve their problems with serverless. For example, some months ago, uh, we added extra storage to Lambda in order for uh, customers that were using machine learning and need to download big models and libraries that they could not do it with Lambda, now they can. So that type of examples, there's so many out there. So think about what you want to do. Try to do it with serverless first, and then if it's not the right solution, try to pick another one. But in general, serverless will cover, I think nowadays, 80, 85% of the use cases with no problem. So now I want to build something. I will not be building it, building it, because I only have like eight minutes or less. So um, I will start by uh, showing you a little bit of code and showing you where you can get that code from. So this is the simplest application. I could come up an API gateway that is um, basically a place where you can manage your APIs. So it's a managed service that will take care of your APIs. And that whenever a new request comes into will trigger one Lambda or the other, depending if the method of the HTTP request is a post or is a get. We have two functions with different code. And then we have a DynamoDB table that is a NoSQL key value pair database service. So all these 
three things are uh, managed services that we will be using. So the first thing that we need to do is to define the infrastructure. For that, you need to write code. You can do it from the AWS console, yes, but I will recommend you to try to learn from the code. The code is the way to go to production, is the way to make this maintainable and, rep and, and reproduce it all the time. So write the code and learn it. With these few lines of code, you will get all the configuration for your Lambda function. You will tell, in this case, where the code is located, what is the runtime. You will give the function permissions to access that table that we are going to access. Then we are creating the trigger for the function, in this case, when the method is paused and the path hello. As I said before, then we need to define the API. This is the API gateway definition with all the core support that is always a pain to write those things. It is quite simple when you're using API gateway. Then we will define the table. Again, a few lines of code that we are defining the NoSQL key value pair table and it's a NoSQL key value. So the only thing you need to define is the name of the key and then the name of the table. This looks scary, but after you've done it a couple of times, it's not scary anymore. The next thing you need to do after you define the infrastructure is write the code, the business logic. In this case, I'm just writing things in the database. I'm grabbing the name from the query string parameters and storing it in the database and then returning something in my HTTP response. You can see, I will leave you the link of the code later so you can check it out as, and, and, and look at it in detail. That is a very, very simple example. And then when you're ready, you have written the code and defined the infrastructure, you just run SAM deployed. I'm using AWS SAM for doing this, but you can use CDK. That is another way of writing infrastructure as code, CloudFormation, Terraform, whatever you like. I have videos in my YouTube channel explaining all of them, so go and check that out. But pick one and, and use that. Don't go for the console. So then I will deploy it and I will get an URL back. That is what you see there. And I can test it in Postman. I can run the get. Uh, for example, in this case, I will just add something to the database. This is hitting the cloud in the Stockholm region. And I just get in my, that something was stored in the database. And then I get back that this was added in the database. Now I try to get something that was never added and it returns me that. It's a really, really stupid example, but business logic and database connection is like 80% of most of the backend. So this can help you to get started. Then we want to build a front end, and I just write a super simple starter React application. I put a little bit of code where I just called my endpoint, and I don't want to hard code my endpoint, so I'm using this uh, AWS config. And then basically, I just need to have a file with all the configuration from AWS. And I have my application working. And this is super, super simple. I have in, in the GitHub repo, you will find in the readme file, like the instructions on how you can build it yourself. So this is just, a, I don't know, two minutes presentation. But I want to show you how simple it is to write this and how powerful. When you know how to write an API gateway, Lambda functions, and Dynamo, you can solve so many problems. And then you can hook up this to our application. And voila, you have a dynamic site. Get the code from this link. You can take a screen share. I will be sharing the slides in a moment. You can find them in my GitHub as soon as I, uh, in my Twitter, as soon as I finish this uh, presentation, I will put the slides there so you can get them. But uh, that's all you need to get started with serverless. That's the first step. And then keep on practicing and solving harder and harder problems. So I think, I don't know how I'm on time, but I usually get excited and speak too fast. I'm super happy to answer any kind of questions questions so yeah that's that's it thank you very much all right uh thank you marcia that was really great and i have received a lot of questions regarding the, the topic yes <laughs> <laughs> awesome yeah so um okay so the first question coming from um the audience named fabro so is serverless application model being phased out in favor of cloud development kit no, nothing is being phased out. AWS doesn't phase out things. We keep with them and we commit to the customers that they have choose these, uh, these tools. So no, 
Uh, SAM is a way of doing uh, infrastructure as code. CDK is a way of doing infrastructure as code, and they are targeted to different audience. So if you are building serverless application, SAM is, is, is way nicer for building functions and API gateways and Dynamo tables, as I show you, is great. But maybe if you want to build more complex applications, you want to build your whole, uh, I don't know, AWS infrastructure, you might like more CDK. CDK is a way that you can use some programming language like uh, TypeScript, Java, C Sharp uh, to write your infrastructure. So what I was showing you with Sam is using YAML. So it's more configuration as code. So, so for some people it's harder. Uh, but CDK, you can use it for all the AWS uh, ecosystem. It's, it's quite great. And I've been using it as a combination of SAM and CDK for my applications nowadays. When I have to build more complex architectures that are not only using the serverless tools, like I'm building a private a virtual uh, networks or I'm building uh, non-serverless databases, I like to use CDK. So it's totally mix and match. Nothing is being phased out. All right. That's awesome. And another uh, question is, is there any plan to support event triggers external to Amazon Web Service? Well, if you want to support uh, things that are external, one good way to go is to use event reach. So event reach is a uh, event bus that you can hook to your serverless application. It's a managed service. And many SaaS providers can connect there. So if you are using Zendesk, Mongo Atlas, and many others, there is uh, the support list is growing all the time. You can uh, use that. And whenever, for example, if you're using Zendesk, a new ticket is created, you will get an event in your application. So that's the way to support event triggers from external services. All right, that was a really clear answer. And I think this is the last question. Um, since we received too many um, questions and concerns on uh, your topic, I will be sending more uh, regarding uh, to your email. So you can, you know, right. have some words. People can contact me on Twitter. I'm super happy always to answer there or check my YouTube channel where I have millions of videos. All right, awesome. So our audience, don't forget that. And this is the last question uh, from my side. So how to push the script file of your demo to Amazon Web Service Lambda? So my demo is a GitHub uh, repo. So you will need to follow the steps that are linked, listed there in the readme file. And in order to do that, you need to have an AWS account. Uh, and you will need to configure uh, your AWS account in your computer. And then you will need to install AWS SAM as in the instructions. And then after that, you can basically follow the steps in my demo. And when you do SAM deploy, it will go to your AWS account. All right. That would be all from my side. So thank you, Marcia, for joining us today. And I'm so happy to hear that you are going to participate in Heltech Cloud Computing. And I believe that our audience too. So that was a really great and informative session with you. Yes, so thank you for um, joining our session. Thank you very much. Yes, all right. Um, so uh, this, I think that would be the conclusion of Heltech Cloud Computing. And what's next for Heltech? It would be uh, Heltech Retail Technology on the 7th of September. And we have uh, three more upcoming really interesting, really uh, trendy uh, speakers and keynotes. So stay tuned, follow us on social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, to receive more news and more upcoming events. And this is Min from Heltech and goodbye.